everyone. I just first want to thank Dr. Afrin for that wonderful overview of mast cell activation syndrome and also a lovely segue into what I'll be talking about today. So I'll be sharing with you about a study that I've been working on with uh, my co-authors listed up there regarding a disease cluster that consists of postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, and mast cell activation syndrome. So why did we go about doing this study? Well, in recent years in the, liter in the literature, um, it's been shown, it's been observed that there have been symptoms suggestive of mast cell activation syndrome in patients who have POTS and or EDS. In, 2000, in 2005, uh, it was shown that there were increased levels of urine biomarkers in people with POTS. And in 2014, 2016, a group showed that there were connective tissue abnormalities and dysautonomia in people with elevated tryptase levels, which Dr. Afrin mentioned was a biomarker of mast cell activation. So we decided to undertake this prospective study to examine a potential linkage between all three of these conditions. So just before I go into what we did, I'm going to go through a quick uh, overview of the criteria that we use to define the three conditions. So first up is hypermobile type Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. We defined our patients as having Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, hypermobility type, um, through the clinical manifestations of a Baton uh, hypermobility score of greater than or equal to five over nine, chronic joint pain and recurrent subluxations, and the absence of atrophic widened scarring skin reactions. And I just wanted to note that we did start the study in the summer of 2014, and that was before the new revised nosology uh, for hypermobility type EDS came out, and so that's why we used the old 1997 nosology. <laughs> Next up, we have postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, and this was characterized by frequent symptoms that occur with standing, including syncope, lightheadedness, palpitations, blurred vision, etc. And also, it was characterized by a heart rate increase of 30 or more beats per minute, uh, going from either sitting or standing sitting or lying down to standing up, as well as an absence of orthostatic hypotension. So no significant decrease in blood pressure when going from sitting or standing, sitting or lying down to standing up. And lastly, we come to mast cell activation syndrome. And we used uh, the proposed diagnostic criteria from Chem Atkins 2010 uh, review, and that included validated symptoms of mast cell activation no primary or secondary causes of mast cell activation, elevated serum or urinary markers of mast cell activation, and a good therapeutic response to anti-mediator therapy. So in the first phase of our study, we recruited patients from an online support group for patients with symptoms of POTS and an inherited connective tissue disorder. We looked for patients who had documented diagnoses of POTS and HEDS, for POTS, we looked for a documented clinical diagnosis and confirmation via tilt table test. And for HEDS, we looked for a documented diagnosis as well as a Bayton hypermobility score of greater than or equal to five over nine. And once we gathered our patients with both POTS and HEDS, we distributed a questionnaire uh, to assess the presentation of any validated symptoms of mast cell mediator release. So here are the results of our first phase of our study. We saw that all of our patients were female and over the age of 25 years. Our total patient cohort consisted of 15 patients. And of those 15 patients, we had 12 patients who had a diagnosis of POTS. Of those 12 POTS patients, we saw that nine of them also had a diagnosis of HEDS. And of those nine patients with POTS and HEDS, we saw that six patients also showed validated symptoms of mast cell activation. So two thirds of our patients with POTS and HEDS also showed symptoms of mast cell activation. And this, because of this data, there seems to be a strong linkage between the three conditions, but given that the studies or the study data is not that robust because we recruited patients from an online support group, we only really communicated with them via email, we recognized that the results were suggestive, but not conclusive. So we undertook a prospective study. And in this prospective study, this time we recruited participants from Dr. Peter Vadis's Allergy and Clinical Immunology Clinic at St. Michael's Hospital right here in downtown Toronto. 
And our recruitment criteria for POTS included a clinical diagnosis based on the criteria outlined in uh, the 2015 review from the Heart Rhythm Society. Again, for HEDS, we used our diagnosis based on the 1997 nosology, as well as a confirmation via transmission electron microscopy of a skin biopsy. So we looked for characteristic things of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, including things like uh, flower-like collagen fibrils, like you see here, as well as a very high degree of variation in the diameter of the collagen fibrils in the skin. And lastly, for mast cell activation syndrome, we also went back again and used the 2010 proposed diagnostic criteria from Chem Atkins' paper, um, including the, or the criteria that I had listed previously. So what did we find? All of our patients showed normal basal tryptase levels, as well as elevated urinary markers of mast cell activation. So non-monoclonal mast cell activation and not mastocytosis. And we, we saw that all of our patients had positive responses to anti-mediator therapy and reported improvement in mast cell activation associated symptoms over the course of their therapy. So here are more detailed results from five of our patients who have been very well characterized. I did want to note that we are adding a few more patients for uh, four more patients specifically. So we do have a total of nine patients at the moment, but I'm just showing the data from five. So in our initial, vis initial visit, we gathered baseline information about mast cell activation associated symptoms, and we prescribed our first round of antihistamines. And you can see here that um, all of the white boxes are showing that the patients did show symptoms of mast cell activation. So they did definitely have all of the symptoms initially. After a few rounds of, um, in our subsequent visits, we monitored our patients' symptoms and added any additional mast cell stabilizers and or anti-leukotriene blockers as needed. Specific medications were added and were directed towards an individual specific symptoms. So for example, if they were showing symptoms that were more systemic, they would be prescribed a mast cell stabilizer such as ketotifen. And if they were showing that uh, not a great response to um, in their GI tract, then they were prescribed something like nalchrom. And patients were um, seen as back as often as ne necessary to stabilize their symptoms and optimize treatment. So you can see here that um, the majority of the symptoms that our patients exhibited at the beginning of our study, they were at least partially suppressed or completely suppressed in some cases. So these positive responses to mast cell-directed therapy in patients with POTS and HEDS strongly supports the co-segregation with mast cell activation syndrome, and it does appear that anti-mediator therapy is most effective for respiratory and cutaneous symptoms. So where do we go from here? Well, there actually has been not that much work published in this area. I mentioned in 2005, there was a study where uh, pot, it was observed in POTS patients that they had higher urinary methylhistamine levels and improved clinical response to histamine receptor blockers. In 2014 and 2016, Josh Milner and his group at NIH looked at different but related patients, patients with familial increase in alpha trip days, and they also showed uh, connective tissue manifestations and POTS-like symptoms. And of course, Dr. Afrin has um, most recently, in earlier this year, shown the, or talked about the roles, the role of mast cells in both EDS and dysautonomia. So our findings do suggest that those with POTS and, H, and or HEDS have a higher risk of also having a diagnosis of mast cell activation syndrome. And as a result, anti-mediator therapy might be an effective treatment to control these mast cell activation associated symptoms in these patients. And to conclude, it is known that there is a lot of overlap between the symptoms of HEDS, POTS, and mast cell activation syndrome. So if we were to take anything from 
the results of the study that I've presented today, it's that if patients have a diagnosis of POTS and or HEDS, they are more likely to have a diagnosis of mast cell activation syndrome as well. And so it's really important that therapies are directed towards each, each of these diagnoses individually in order to really optimize treatment and improve the quality of life of these patients. Thank you. I just wanted to acknowledge. <laughs>